welcome back for another Sheriff of Sodium video, the case for residency application caps. Now, if you've followed me for any length of time, you know that I'm a believer that over-application is the original sin. It is the, the root of many of the problems that we face today in residency selection and medical education. And from my standpoint, we are not going to get out from under those problems until and unless we impose some limit on the number of applications that applicants can submit. But despite the correctness of my beliefs and the unassailable intellectual rigor of my position, many of you all remain unconvinced. And if you're unconvinced that we need application caps, then listen, this video is for you. Because what I'm going to go through is I'm going to go through what I see as many of the tired objections to application caps. And I'm going to try to show you how a capped system would be a better system. But we're not going to get there in one step. Before we start talking about application caps, we're going to talk about something completely different. Toilet paper. The image on your screen here is going to be a familiar one to many of you because I'm, I'm sure that you all have seen something similar. This is a picture from April of 2020 at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic in the United States. And what you're looking at is, is shelves that are stripped bare of all the toilet paper. There's not a roll to be found. Why did this happen? Why did all the toilet paper disappear? I mean, this sudden scarcity of toilet paper, it wasn't because suddenly people needed twice as much to manage their bathroom needs. I mean, that did not happen. Thank God. And it wasn't because there was some kind of catastrophic disruption to the supply chain. I mean, suppliers were producing just as much toilet paper as they ever had, but it wouldn't stay on the shelves. The depletion of toilet paper had only to do with human psychology. It all started after a few consumers bought a little extra TP because, you know, the news was making that COVID thing sound pretty bad. But then when other people went to the store to make their usual toilet paper run, they had trouble finding any toilet paper. There wasn't any on the shelves. And so when they finally did, when they finally went to a store that had some toilet paper, they bought extra just to make sure that they had enough for their own family in these uncertain times. And after a few people started doing that, what did everybody have to do? We all had to start hoarding toilet paper. We all had to start buying extra. Because as the shelves emptied out, the panic spread. You know, we had to buy extra toilet paper for no other reason than because other people were buying extra toilet paper. And from a societal standpoint, we all would have been better off if everybody just was kind enough to purchase only enough toilet paper to keep their own individual bottoms neat and tidy. And then the shelves would have refilled and anybody who needed toilet paper could have bought some. But from an individual standpoint, if toilet paper was scarce, you'd be a fool not to buy as much of it as you could. I mean, who cares? Who cares if your neighbor's butt stinks? I mean, you're not going to be quarantined with them. This is a perfect example of how doing something that's perfectly rational for an individual ends up making the system worse for everybody. But before we try to apply that principle to residency application, let's remember how the great toilet paper crisis of 2020 ended. It didn't end because Charmin airlifted in pallets of toilet paper to all the needy grocery stores just in the nick of time to, to satisfy the hoarding mobs. That didn't happen. Instead, in the absence of an individual incentive to ration appropriately, an external actor had to impose some limits. And so retailers started uh, putting limits on the amount of toilet paper that individual customers could buy. You couldn't go in and buy 50 rolls. You could buy a smaller amount. and You could come back later and get more if you needed it. And this kind of rationing, that, that usually does not sit well with Americans. I mean, we live in a nation where um, it's the land of the free and the home of capitalism, and we hold it as a self-evident truth that a person should be allowed to have as much of a thing as he or she has money to pay for it. And yet there are times when enforced rationing is the only way to make a marketplace work efficiently. This can be a tough concept to wrap your head around. And look, I get it. I'm a free market guy. I think that free markets are, are often the most efficient way to ensure that people get their best outcomes. And it's counterintuitive to tell someone that if your goal is to get toilet paper, that you're actually going to be better served by buying less of it when that's what you came to do. And to understand why it might be true, you have to look beyond your own hands. You have to think about the incentives of other people in the marketplace. Because if they also have an incentive to hoard toilet paper, you're going to be stuck in this never-ending arms race for toilet paper. And I would put it to you that residency selection is no different. 
Individually, applicants have an incentive to overapply. But the more that certain individuals overapply, the more everyone else has to overapply just to keep up. It's a never ending arms race that's more and more expensive every year. It puts more and more burden on program directors every year. And it leads to a system that's more chaotic and seemingly capricious than it needs to be. But to convince you to take that leap, to give up some of your liberty in order to, to save some of your money, and in order to get your application more thoroughly reviewed, and in order to get the same result at the end of the day, to convince you that you can do that, we've got to separate some myth from reality. So that's exactly what we're going to do. Myth number one. If you implement application caps, the match rate will plummet. No, no it won't. Let's first think about this with some real numbers. In 2020, the average U.S. senior applied to 70 residency programs. In 2020, U.S. seniors had a match rate of 93.9%. So what would happen? What would happen if, if U.S. seniors decided just to apply to half as many programs? What would their match rate be? Well, you know what? We don't actually have to speculate because application fever has created a natural experiment for us. What I'm showing you here is the trend in applications per applicant over time. And if you go back to 2007, U.S. seniors were only submitting 32 applications apiece on average. So what do you think the match rate was then? Well, it was 93.4%, 93.44%. In fact, the match rate for U.S. seniors has been between 92 and 94% for decades. The point here is the match rate is a function of the number of positions available and the number of applicants for those positions. The match rate is not a function of the number of applications that each applicant submits. And if that basic arithmetic is not intuitive to you, I want you to do another little thought experiment. Imagine that we wanted to improve the match rate, and so we let everyone start applying to more and more programs, more and more specialties. At what point would we hit a 100% match rate for all applicants? It would never happen. It would never happen. And it's obvious that, that, that the match rate does not depend on the number of applications that people collectively submit. Unless an application cap were so restrictive that it prevented applicants and programs from finding each other, which, which I think would probably require limiting applications to less than five or 10, the match rate is not going to budge, especially if we phase in application caps over time and slowly ratchet down the ceiling of programs to which people can apply. So if you've heard this myth and it's made you think that application caps are bad because it's going to change the match rate, you've just been the victim of fear mongering. So let's move on. Myth number two. But I don't go to a prestigious medical school. I need to apply to a lot of programs or I'm not going to match. Well, let's think about this one first through the lens of the toilet paper example that we had before. Let's think back to that guy who's buying 400 rolls of toilet paper at Costco. He doesn't need 400 rolls. I mean, let's, let's hope he doesn't. The reason that he's hoarding toilet paper, the reason he has to hoard toilet paper is because everybody else is hoarding toilet paper. And if he chooses not to, and everybody else does, then he's screwed. He's going to be wiping his butt with a stack of leftover fast food napkins. And that's the situation that residency applicants are stuck in. The main reason that they have to overapply is because everyone else is overapplying. Overapplying does not improve the overall match rate. I hope I've thoroughly dispelled that in the, in the previous section. But it does. It does increase the likelihood that an individual student will match. This is a point that I think is intuitive, but it can be modeled mathematically from the standpoint of game theory. And, and when you do, it provides some clarity, I think, about the predicament that applicants are stuck in. So that's what I'm going to do for you right here. So quickly, imagine that we have two applicants, applicant A and applicant B. And these applicants are indistinguishable. They have the same step scores, the same background, the same everything. But they have a choice about how many residency programs that they're going to apply to. They can choose to apply to fewer or they can choose to apply to more. And their outcome is determined by the choice that they make and the choice that their competition, the choice that their other applicants make. So if applicant A chooses to apply to fewer programs while applicant B applies to more, the payoff that's listed in each cell is the percent likelihood of going unmatched. So if applicant A applies to fewer programs, he's going to get burned. 
he's going to have a 10% chance of going unmatched, while applicant B now has a 2% chance of going unmatched. Applicant A, therefore, would want to apply to more programs, and so will applicant B. And every time you run this, there's an incentive to choose to apply to more programs. Over-application, therefore, is a dominant strategy, and the situation approximates what's called a prisoner's dilemma. And what that means is that the individual choice to over-apply, it's a dominant strategy. There's no reason you would choose anything other, but it results in an outcome that's actually inferior to what you would have gotten by cooperating. Notice that this cell, when both applicants over-apply, has a 6% chance of going unmatched. And that's because of the chaos in the marketplace. As people apply to more and more and more programs, programs are less able to discern applicants who are truly interested. And people are more likely to get lost somewhere in the shuffle. The point here is, over-application individually is a rational choice. It's not fair to blame students for over-applying. And it's stupid, frankly, to suggest to students that they do something that's against their own best interest when other applicants are not going to do that thing. Students are stuck in an arms race, and application caps are the only way to end it. Let's go to myth number three. But, 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 but I'm an international medical graduate. I need to apply to a lot of programs or I won't match. All right. Well, let's suppose there's a guy who needs some toilet paper. And so he goes to a store and they're sold out. So he goes to another store and they're sold out. And he goes to another and another. And he drives all around town and he goes to 20 different stores. And he finally comes home with a single pack of Charmin. Now, which of the following statements about that person's experience is more true? Is it A, that he had to go to 20 stores? He had to, or else he wouldn't have come home with any toilet paper. Or is it B, he could have gone to just one store and gotten the exact same outcome if he only knew which store was most likely to have toilet paper. And when I frame it this way, when I make the example about toilet paper, everybody picks B. They say, oh yeah, B is the more correct answer. But if we're talking about residency selection, I hear people say, oh, it's A, it's A. I have to apply to 100 programs because I'm an international medical graduate. Usually this takes the form of personal anecdote. So-and-so is an IMG, and I applied to 200 programs, and I got three interviews. Caps won't work. You know, I've got to apply to a lot of programs. And sometimes I'll push back, and I'll say, I mean, really? You think the programs that, uh, that gave you an interview, do you think that's because, you know, they looked at your application, and they were, like, about to put it in the discard pile, and then they were like, what, what, what? This guy's applied to 200 programs. We've got to give him an interview. I mean, of course not. Of course not. The real issue is that applicants, especially international medical graduates, do not have enough information to know where their application is going to be competitive. If they only knew who was likely to favorably review their application, they would not have to apply to 200 residency programs. It's a real problem. But what I'll ask you is this. Is the solution to that problem to demand transparency from programs? Or is it to continue to allow applicants to waste their money applying to programs where their application is just going to sit unread in some heiress hell? I think it's the former. Let's move on to myth number four. But I'm applying in a competitive specialty. I need to apply to a lot of programs or I won't match. You can see I get all these objections all the time, and, and so I'm going to try to come at this a slightly different way, okay? And what I want you to think about is what is the broken part in our current system? I'm going to show you some data. This, this shows the, the mean applications submitted by applicants in different specialties, and it shows the number of contiguous ranks, according to NRMP data, that were submitted by applicants who had a better than 90% match rate. We can use the number of contiguous ranks submitted as a proxy for the number of interviews completed. It's true, some applicants don't rank every single program at which they interview, but according to the NRMP's applicant survey, the median number of interviews completed and the median number of programs ranked is the same. So as you can see above, the average MD student these days submits 81.5 applications. But if you have 12 interviews, that group of applicants has a better than 90% match rates. Diagnostic radiology applicants, I mean, apply to 58 programs if you wish. The average student does. But 
all you need to do is interview ad and rank seven to join a group of applicants that has a better than 90% chance of matching. For family medicine, go ahead and apply to 42 programs if you got the money to burn, but, but know that applicants who rank just five programs have a better than 90% chance of matching. And yeah, I realize that most applicants would never settle for just a 90% chance of matching. But here's the reality. Last year, there were 1.4 applicants for every position in orthopedics. There are 1.49 for every position in diagnostic radiology. And there are 1.54 applicants for every position in family medicine. So let every applicant apply to every single program if you want. But there is no way to give everyone a 100% chance of matching. What should be clear from these numbers is that, that we need to give better information to our applicants. You can apply to any number of programs that aren't going to interview you, and it betters your chances of matching not one bit. Think about these data when you're deciding what to advocate for. Are you better off advocating to preserve your liberty to submit an unlimited amount of applications and spend an untold sum of money applying to programs that are gonna instantaneously filter out your application? Or are you better off advocating for more transparency from programs and a level playing field for the number of applications that we all submit? On to myth number five, capping residency applications is unfair. To rebut this claim, we need to look at some real data because we need to have a shared understanding of the reality of the residency selection marketplace. What I'm showing you here is a graphic that shows the ratio of available PGY1 positions per each active applicant. So a ratio greater than one means that there are more positions than there are applicants. But you can see we haven't been there since 1992. Every year since, we've had more applicants than we have positions. The point is, on match day, not everybody's going to win. And the reality is, even if we increase the number of positions, those positions are not necessarily going to be in the specialties that perfectly approximate what people want to match in, or they're not going to perfectly approximate the geographic di distribution of where people want to train. The point is, there's always going to be competition, and in this competition, some people are going to win and some people are going to lose. The best that we can do is make that competition fair. So let me ask you this. Is allowing residency positions to be assigned by willingness to pay for applications, is that fair? I mean, look, we've already established students overapply because it benefits them to do so. You hold everything else constant, and the student who applies to 100 otolaryngology programs has a better chance of realizing their dream of becoming an otolaryngologist than somebody who's just the same as them but applies to 30. But step back and think about this for a minute. We live in a country that prizes the idea, at least, of meritocracy. So what kind of merit does our system reward? I can't think of any. Instead, it seems to provide a relative advantage to applicants who have more money or maybe greater willingness to incur debt. And of all the ways that we could select applicants for residency, is that really how we want to do it? I say we level the playing field. I say let all applicants pay the same price and apply to the same number of programs, and let program directors separate the most meritorious applicants in a system in which they can actually read the number of applications that they receive. All right, myth number six. Capping applications only benefits applicants from elite schools. The reality is that capping applications benefits anyone whose merit isn't captured by convenience metrics. So again, think this one through with some real data. Just for sake of example, let's use general surgery, and I want you to put yourself in the position of the program director. In 2020, there were 1,536 categorical general surgery positions. There were 328 programs, which means that the average program was looking to fill just 4.7 positions. So you're the program director, you're trying to fill 4.7 positions. And on average, from the NRMP's program director survey, we know that the average program gets 742 applications. 742 applications for 4.7 positions means that you're getting 158 applications per position. We also know the average general surgery program, again from NRMP data, um, extends 85 interview offers, which is 11% of the applications that they receive. 
So let's think about all these numbers. Suppose that you're the program director and you want to spend just 10 minutes reading every application that you get, every one of those 742. It will take you 124 hours to get through all of them. Now maybe that'd be okay if program directors were like admissions officers who get to spend all their time evaluating applications and doing admissions stuff. But you know, being a program director is a part-time gig. Most of the time that you even get to allocate toward being a program director, you have to spend taking care of the residents who are actually already in your program. So how are you going to get through the pile? You're going to use a convenience screening metric. You're going to see what ARIS filters you can apply, and you're going to apply them. So maybe you exclude applicants whose USMLE score is below some arbitrary threshold. Or maybe you filter out the osteopathic students, or maybe you filter out the IMGs, or maybe you filter out applications with a gap year since their graduation, or, or maybe you filter out people that are outside of a small number of prestigious feeder schools. You might know that none of these factors are good predictors of an applicant's capability to perform surgery, and, and you might know that you're leaving talent on the table, but buddy, you just got to get through the pile. Now, there's something else more insidious, though, because I want you to think about what happens when all program directors use the same convenience metrics. Well, they end up inviting the same applicants over and over and over. Again, let's talk with real numbers. So among the U.S. seniors who applied in general surgery, a group that applied to an average of 66 programs, among that group, 16% were members of AOA. 28% attended one of the top 40 medical schools and 16% had a USMLE step score over 250. So if you're one of those applicants and you apply to 66 programs, how many interview invitations do you think you're going to get? I'm guessing 66 or, or pretty darn close to it. So think for a moment about the downstream consequences. There's a paper that actually sought to quantify this. This is a paper from Laryngoscope in 2019. And using NRMP data, the authors estimated that just 12% of general surgery applicants consumed half of all the interview spots. When elite applicants overapply, they get overinvited to interview, and it wastes the applicant's money, it wastes the program director's time, and it diminishes opportunity for other applicants. I think it's easy to look at these data and conclude. See, this is why I've got to overapply. See, I mean, these elite applicants, they're getting interviews from every program. So for a little old me to get a shot on goal, I've got to apply to, you know, a thousand programs. But is that really the only logical conclusion you can draw from these data? Is it also not a logical conclusion that maybe, just maybe, everybody ought to apply less? In a bigger sense, if you're an applicant and you want a program director to be able to see you as a whole person, if you want them to see you as something more than just your USMLE score or the prestige of your medical school or your citizenship status, then application caps are going to help you because without caps, everyone is going to be reduced down to whatever variable can be filtered in ARIS. All right, myth number seven, capping applications will make the application process more stressful and chaotic. I think the reality here is that in a world of uncontrolled application, we already have a system that's stressful and chaotic and unpredictable, and it ain't going to get better as people apply to more and more and more programs. Want to see what I mean? Let me show you some more NRMP data. What I've got here is a graph that shows you the proportion of U.S. seniors who successfully matched at their top-ranked program. That's the red curve above. So you can see that you go back 20 years and 60% of U.S. seniors matched to their top choice. The bottom curve, the blue curve, uh, is the proportion of U.S. seniors that matched at a program that they ranked fourth or lower. What you'll see is that over time, as applicants have applied to more and more programs, there has been a slow and steady erosion in the fraction of U.S. seniors that have successfully matched at their top choice, such that last year, 47% ranked matched at their top ranked program, which was the lowest on record. This is an entirely predictable consequence of a congested market that lacks preference signaling. And look, without intervention, it will likely soon lead to a preventable increase in the number of good applicants who fall through the cracks. Let's move on to myth number eight. If you cap applications, an East Coast applicant will never get into a West Coast program. 
The reality here is that capping applications gives the program an incentive to take your application seriously. Remember, when applicants overapply, programs lose their ability to separate applicants who are truly interested from those who just have a shotgun approach that sent some buckshot in their direction. So when a West Coast program gets an application from somebody on the East Coast, it's easy to dismiss it. It's easy to say, that guy's never coming here. I mean, just put that to the side. But forget about geography, because the inability to discern true interest, it's causing bigger problems. Last year, I had an interesting conversation with the general surgery program director who, um, who leads a very respectable and well-known program. And this person actually screens out applicants who have high USMLE scores. And he does that because he's learned that these applicants almost never end up matching at his programs. Now, I want you to set aside for a moment the fact that USMLE scores are not the best measure of who's going to succeed in residency. Because let me tell you that this conversation arose out of a series of conversations that I got to have with this person that started with us debating about USMLE pass-fail. And this is a person who, in matter of fact, believes that USMLE scores do identify the best candidates. So pause and think about that for a minute. You have a program director whose mission is to recruit the best residents that he can into his program. And he has a metric that he believes tells him the best applicants, and he is turning away the top 5 to 10% of people who apply to his program just because he perceives that, that they're applying there as a safety and that they're not actually going to come. Honestly, folks, how bad has it gotten when the act of paying to send an application to a program cannot be viewed as a credible signal that, yeah, you're actually interested in going there? But think about it. The calculus changes once you cap applications. Students now have an incentive to apply only to programs where they have serious interest, and program directors now have an incentive to take every single one of those applications seriously. Time for myth number nine. We don't need to cap applications, just cap the number of interviews an applicant can accept instead. The idea of capping interviews has gained a lot of traction over the past year. And, um, and let me be frank, I support the idea. It would curtail interview hoarding, and it would ensure that applicants who interview at your program really have interest there, and those are good things. But from my standpoint, it's still a half measure because it does almost nothing to help program directors with the burden of applications they receive. Remember, this is what program directors are up against. What I'm showing you here is the number of applications received per available position in the match. And as you can see, in many competitive specialties like orthopedics, dermatology, neurosurgery, programs routinely receive more than 100 applications per available position. But look, even in specialties that are considered not especially competitive for U.S. seniors, things like family medicine or uh, internal medicine, those specialties actually lead the pack in the number of applications received per available position. And that's because even though those specialties may not attract a ton of applicants from, um, from U.S. medical schools, they attract many international medical graduates, and, and those applicants apply to a ton of programs. The point here is that no program escapes unscathed. I've said it before, but I'm going to say it again. If you're an applicant and you want programs to see you as an individual, if you want them to read the things in your ARIS application that you spent hours putting in and, and years achieving, if you want it to be seen as something other than what's easily filterable in ARIS, then you have to support application caps. And that's the main reason that I don't prefer capping interviews. I also have some worry that there will be unintended consequences of interview caps, because whatever number we use to cap interviews at, say we pick a cap of 15, which I think would be very reasonable, in a way we're going to create an incentive for applicants to get up to that threshold, because that's the only way you can win the game. That's the only way you can maximize your chances of matching is by interviewing at as many programs as fills your cap. I think we're going to have some people who were happy interviewing at fewer programs who are going to now apply to more. Now, that's not necessarily a fatal flaw of capping interviews, but it's something we need to be prepared for. Let's move on to myth number 10. If you cap applications, applicants from lower tier medical schools will never get into the top programs. Now, this, this is an insidious myth because it has the ring of truth to it, and it's something that's been drilled into our heads from the beginning. Oh, you're from a non-top 25 medical school? Oh, you're a DO? Oh, you're an IMG? You better apply, 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 apply. You have to apply to a ton of programs or you're never going to match. But ultimately, when you examine this carefully, I think that it's illogical. In the first place, 
you know, when you cap applications, a lot of things might happen, but I'm going to tell you one that almost certainly won't. When you cap applications, Harvard Medical School will not suddenly graduate a thousand students a year. Johns Hopkins, Mayo Clinic, they similarly are not going to double the size of their graduating class just because applications are capped. What that means is that if students from lower tier schools successfully match in orthopedics or neurosurgery or at a prestigious internal medical student program, they will still match at that program. Remember, whether you match or don't is a function of the number of programs and the number of positions available and the number of applicants for those positions. Unless there's a fundamental change in that market, there will not be a change. There's a second part of this that I also think is illogical. I mean, if your application doesn't stand out at a prestigious program that's getting 20 applications for every position, it wasn't going to stand out when they were getting 200 or 300 applications for every spot either. I think the reason that this myth is so resonant is because people think about it from a standpoint of probability and they say, hey, look, I'm not the best applicant, but maybe maybe I submit applications to the top 10 programs and I got a 1% chance of getting an interview at each. So I submit applications to all 10 of them and now I got a 10% cumulative probability of getting an interview at one of them. And I think what really is going to happen is that you're going to swap that 1% that chance at 10 programs with a 10% chance at one program. And so the more nuanced truth here is that application caps are going to reward thoughtful applications. That right there, that's the benefit and that's the risk of application caps. Because what is true is that if you cap applications, there's going to be a new emphasis on deciding where to apply. And ultimately, from my standpoint, that's the real issue that we have to confront in order for caps to be a workable solution. Right now, programs provide very little useful information to help applicants decide where they're a good fit or where their application is going to be reviewed favorably. Program websites are horrible. Many of them are so hopelessly generic that, that spamming all the programs in a given geographic area or specialty is honestly a totally rational strategy. It's better than taking on the information cost of actually trying to look at these things. And honestly, from a program standpoint, What's the point in explaining how you pick applicants? What, why even put that on your website? I mean, if all you're going to use is an heiress filter, you might as well just save your time. You're going to get spam with applications anyhow. Just save your time for application season. I've discussed before that it wouldn't be that hard for programs to provide higher quality information to applicants. In fact, in the notes below, I'm going to link to a previous video called Applying Smarter that I made that discusses this very point. But let me be clear here that giving applicants better information is a mandatory prerequisite to instituting CAPS. But to me, that seems like a fair trade-off. If programs want to get fewer applications, they need to provide some transparency and clarity to applicants. Let's move on. Myth 11. Application CAPS are un-American. We don't CAP applications for any other field. This one I honestly find a little bit laughable. I mean, it's true. Yeah, when you apply to medical school or when you apply for a job as a physician, there's no caps. You can apply to as many places as you damn well please. <laughs> but buddy, I mean, the residency match is already unlike any other field. What do you think you're applying for? I mean, residency selection is not a free market. It's a design market. It was designed at a time when both programs and applicants felt like they were not being served by a free market system. And whether you like it or not, we're stuck with it now. In 2004, Congress granted specific antitrust protection to the NRMP to conduct the match. But that has an upside too. You know, the cool thing about a design market is that we get to decide the rules for how it works. There's no reason to cling to some false notion of ideology when all it takes, all we have to do is impose some simple boundaries to make our design market work more efficiently. Myth number 12. Some applicants apply to multiple specialties. Caps will only work if you let those applicants have a higher cap. If you believe this myth, I think you need to spend a few minutes thinking about a little thing called the law of unintended consequences. And while you're thinking about that, I want you to remember that one of the troubling Machiavellian aspects of application fever is that applicants are not just applying to more programs within the same specialty. They're applying to more distinct specialties too. So here again are some data that I've derisively mocked in the past. The ARIS cross-specialty applicant data. And this is a table that lists all the specialties that you can apply to in ARIS, and they're listed in each column, and they're listed again in the rows. And 
the intersection. Each cell has a number, and that number corresponds to the number of individual applicants who applied to each one of those specialties in the year of our Lord, 2020. And so from this table, we can learn, for instance, that there were 193 applicants who applied in both radiation oncology and dermatology. Now, perhaps those 193 individuals are just truly undecided between a career treating cancer with radiation and a career of treating cancer that's caused by radiation. Or perhaps, just perhaps, they're applying to one of these specialties as a backup. And let me be clear, I mean, there's nothing wrong with being undecided. Matter of fact, back in the day, I actually applied to residency programs in three different specialties. I applied in internal medicine, pediatrics, and med peds. And there's nothing wrong with applying to a backup specialty. I mean, the reality is that um, only about 80% of U.S. seniors who prefer dermatology are actually going to match in dermatology. So it's, it's a good idea to have a backup plan. But I think the question you have to ask when you're designing the system for everyone is, are we obligated to allow indecision or backup plans to gum up the system for every single other person? I say no. I say you cap applications and you give everybody the freedom to decide how to spend them. If you want to go all in with this high risk, high reward strategy and use all 20 of your applications, let's say, to apply to prestigious programs or in a selective specialty, have at it. I mean, it's America. Take, take your shot. On the other hand, if you choose that you want to save some of them for a backup specialty, that's fine. And, and honestly, if that results in fewer applicants choosing to pursue these, these highly selective specialties, is that really a bad thing? I mean, is that a bad thing for society? More importantly, if you cap applications, but you allow people who are applying in multiple specialties to apply to extra programs, you can guarantee that these data are going to become even more ridiculous. And let's be honest, they're pretty ridiculous already. Notice that the only combination of specialties that got zero applications last year, the only combination was otolaryngology and nuclear medicine, which somehow did not garner even a single application. Look, applicants will always have an incentive to overapply. I hope we've established that. So when we fix it, we need to be careful that we don't create incentives that work against what we're trying to accomplish. That brings us to our final myth, myth number 13. Application caps are illegal. This one comes up a lot, uh, especially when I'm debating with people on social media. And interestingly, it seems to arise from people who I think just don't like the idea of application caps for one of the other reasons that I've mentioned previously. And they'll say, oh, well, it doesn't matter. They're illegal. You can't do it anyway. They, usually the people who voice this objection are not really the, uh, the Clarence Darrow or uh, Johnny Cochran types. But the premise is that, um, that, that application caps might run afoul of restraint of trade laws. The idea is that, you know, in America, we, we value the free market. We usually allow people to buy and sell their wares without, you know, uh, interference with that. And so by imposing an arbitrary limit on the number of residency applications that a person could submit, we might be unreasonably restraining their ability to, to sell their services and conduct their business. I have a couple things to say about that. The first is that if you believe this to be a true objection, if you believe that application caps are illegal, then interview caps are almost certainly illegal as well. I mean, you could imagine the first time that you have an applicant who, uh, let's say we cap interviews at, at 15 interviews a person. We, we cap them and somebody goes unmatched and he says, hey, you know, I had 30 interview offers, but because you illegally restrained my trade, you know, I could only interview at 15 places and because of that, I didn't match. He might have a case, right? I mean, he could assert that we had unreasonably um, restrained his ability to apply his trade with, um, with interview caps. But I think the key word in that, in that scenario and when you think about application caps more broadly, the key word is unreasonable. Because look, we restrain trade all the time. I mean, why can't I hire an employee who wanted to work for less than minimum wage? Why can't I corner the market on a particular good? Why can't I sell you one of my kidneys? I mean, for various reasons, we regulate and restrain free trade all of the time. And let me be frank, I'm not an attorney. I'm not even a guy who knows very much about the law. But even the most cursory lint research shows that restraints of trade can be legal if the restraints are reasonable. And generally speaking, um, a legal standard for reasonable restraint of trade might require that, that this restraint, number one, serves a legitimate interest. 
Number two, that it's limited to that particular interest. And number three, that it doesn't run contrary to the public interest. Think about that for a moment. Would application caps fit that standard? I say yes. I mean, in the aggregate, over-application does not help programs, it does not help applicants, and it certainly does not serve the public interest. However, as the corporate sponsor for the Electronic Residency Application Service, application fever most certainly has served the AAMC's interest. You've seen this chart before. It shows how revenue growth from ARIS has almost tripled from 2008 to 2019, with revenue from ARIS totaling $94 million thanks to application fever. And so, although I suspect that CAPS could be configured to withstand legal review, this is America. And I mean, you can sue anybody for anything. And so the AMC would have to be willing to, to defend CAPS in court. They would have to be willing to articulate why it was a reasonable standard. In light of these data, would they? I doubt it. What seems more likely is that the AMC would use the threat of a lawsuit as a way to justify dragging their feet in considering caps. After all, they got 94 million reasons to be defenders of the free market. And if that's the tactic they take, then I would encourage everyone who supports caps to do the same and remind them that it is a free market and that ARIS provides a service that, although valuable, is not irreplaceable. Folks, it's a secure website. It's a website that allows programs and applicants to, to log in securely and upload documents and look at stuff. It's hardly something that someone else couldn't design. And so imagine for a moment that a bold specialty decided to pull their, their programs out of ARIS and say, you know what, application fever is out of control. It's hurting us, it's hurting people who want to do our specialty, and we're not doing it anymore. So if you don't impose caps, we're going to make our own application service where we're going to limit applications to 30 or, or whatever, we want, whatever we want to do. You think that's not feasible? You think it's an empty threat? I don't know. Start showing this graphic around in uh, Silicon Valley. See if you can find some folks who, who build websites. See if they might be interested in building one for your specialty for a fraction of this annual revenue. You might find some takers. My point is that application caps are feasible, whether, whether with the AMC support or without. And with that, I'm going to bring this video to a close. Before I do, let me remind you that most of what I've discussed here, I've already written up on my website in a post called On Toilet Paper and Application Caps. So if you prefer a prose version or you want to share a prose version of this video with somebody who, who prefers words to video, please do. I'll link to it in the notes below. Now, I hope that if you made it this far in the video, I hope I've convinced at least a few of you of the potential value in application caps. But I'm realistic. Yeah, I know it's a tough sell. I think many people are very quick to reject application caps out of hand because when they imagine it, they imagine a system where their applications would be limited and they would be disadvantaged because they imagine that nothing else in the system would change. To really understand the benefit of application caps, you have to imagine how everything else will change, not just your applications, but everyone else's as well, the way that programs evaluate your applications. I've spent a lot of time thinking about it, and for me, I'm pretty convinced. But look, that doesn't mean that we need to jump into application caps headlong. In all likelihood, I don't think we would want to go from our current situation to a sudden tight cap in just one step. More, right, more likely, I think the better way of doing it is to ratchet down the cap each year until we get to a goal and we can study outcomes the whole time that we do. I'm okay with a gradual approach. I'm okay with continued study. I'm okay with careful deliberation. But let me tell you what I'm not okay with, our current inertia. Make no mistake, application fever is hurting us. We're allowing our medical students to be plundered for application fees, and then we shrug our shoulders as their unread applications just sit in heiress purgatory because they didn't chase enough empty brass rings to pass some automated filter. We're sitting idle as our programs get buried beneath applications, and then they waste their time rolling out the red carpet for applicants who don't even really give a rip about their program and may not even want to imagine that specialty. We're allowing the narrow self-interest of a few to supersede the consideration of better policy for the many. And I'm tired of it, and I hope you are too. It's time to stop acting like application fever is a problem. It's just going to get better on its own. It won't. I hope that if I've convinced you of anything, I hope I've convinced you of that. 
tomorrow's medical students are going to apply to more programs than today's because the marginal cost of a few more applications is always going to be lower than the cost of going unmatched. And if we choose to do nothing, we're choosing to sit back and watch the continued erosion of medical education into the lowest heiress filterable unit just because we figured out how individuals can optimize their outcomes in the current system and people are too afraid to change the rules. We're choosing to allow residency selection to become an even more stressful, chaotic, unpredictable, and expensive process that ultimately benefits no one other than the AMC corporate executives. And if you ask me, that's a bad choice. And I hope that after consideration, you'll agree. That's all I've got.